meeting of the Williamsburg Jamestown County School Board is called to order. We need to certify closed session. I have a motion. I certify to the best of each member's knowledge that the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Second. Second. Any discussion? Ms. Serza? Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Ongby? Aye. Uh, the next uh, item is uh, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, item 3.1. We have a fifth grader from Matthew Whaley. Ms. Tabitha Anderson is going to lead us in the pledge. Everyone please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Tabitha. <coughs> Ms. Serza, would you take the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Here. <coughs> Ms. Cook. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Only. Here. And item 3.3, .3, approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to do that? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza? Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Ongby? Aye. This moves us to announcements of superintendent's report. Dr. Heron? Good evening, Madam Chair. As we come and celebrate our Teachers of the Year this evening, it is also appropriate to recognize and thank our community for the support it provides to our teachers and schools. For example, the WJCC Schools Education Foundation is finalizing the innovative, innovative learning grants that will be awarded to enrich learning opportunities at schools all across the division. <coughs> Since the foundation was founded in 2015, more than $115,000 has been awarded to 138 teachers. The foundation will award the next round of innovative learning grants next Tuesday on March 26th. You can read more about the WJC Schools Foundation and its work to support our schools in its recently distributed four-year impact report, and there's a picture up on the screen. You will see a few pictures from the report, and this year, for the first time, the foundation enlisted the help of students at Lafayette High School to design, lay out, and edit the report. This is a great example of project-based learning and practical application of learning that the Link 5 class of 2022 students are undertaking in Ms. Pete's and Ms. Bibbins' classes. Thank you to the WJC Schools Foundation for giving students this real-life learning opportunity. Finally, this evening, I'd like to remind parents about the Parent Academy event scheduled for tomorrow night. Presented in collaboration with Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters, the focus of the session is positive discipline. Parents will learn techniques to be firm yet kind when disciplining five to 12 year old children. The Parent Academy begins tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. in the Media Center of James Blair Middle School. That's all of the announcements this evening. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Um, Ms. Taylor, do you have an update for us? I'm going to hold that till my comments. Okay. But I do have a SIAC update. Okay, are there any, any additional updates or information? Okay. Moving on to um, item uh, 5.1, we have recognition of students and staff. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today we are excited to recognize 17 of the division's outstanding teachers. The WJCC Teacher of the Year program allows us to pay tribute to teachers who are exceptionally skilled, dedicated, and who demonstrate excellence in their classroom. Each school year, each, sorry, each school teacher of the year is selected by peers for their outstanding classroom instruction and leadership. 
These teachers embody WJC's core values of individualism, integrity, innovation, accountability, and collaboration. I am very proud to congratulate the following teachers for being named Teacher of the Year for their schools. Bright Beginnings Teacher of the Year, Patricia Harris. Bird Baker, teacher of <laughs> Clara Bird Baker, teacher of the year, Diane Howell. <laughs> DJ Montague, teacher of the year, Abby Reynolds. J.B. Blayton, Teacher of the Year, Rose Marsh. <laughs> James River, Teacher of the Year, Janet Delfico. Laurel Lane, Teacher of the Year, Erin Elmore. <laughs> Batoka, Teacher of the Year, Roxana Janafik. Matthew Whaley, Teacher of the Year, Meredith Watkins. <laughs> George, Teacher of the Year, Cindy Cattell. Stonehouse Teacher of the Year, Julie Lipscomb. <laughs> Berkeley Teacher of the Year, Mary Glisson. James Blair, Teacher of the Year, Casey Ford Starry. <laughs> Lois S. Hornsby, Teacher of the Year, Andrea Lane. Tuano Teacher of the Year, Jennifer Brungut. <laughs> Jamestown Teacher of the Year, Melissa Furr. Lafayette Teacher of the Year, Jennifer Swinson. <laughs> Anne 
Mount Warhill Teacher of the Year, Christina Marshburn. Congratulations, teachers. <laughs> Okay, just before we finish, if the principals would like to join us at the front of the room, that would be wonderful. You're getting all of them in the picture. So let's have everyone come down one more step. There, there we go. go. Congratulations again, teachers. We appreciate all of the work, the great work that you do, and we look forward to welcoming the Division Teacher of the Year at a celebration. <laughs> Madam Chair, that concludes the recognitions for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Heron. I'm just going to wait a couple minutes. budget statement. Okay, moving on to item 5.2, School Spotlight. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tonight, the School Spotlight shines on Matthew Whaley Elementary School, where learning is in full bloom, thanks to an amazing outdoor learning space. Principal Robin Ford is here with a group of students and staff and a very special community partner in education. Welcome, Mrs. Ford. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school board, and Dr. Heron. I'm Robin Ford, principal of Matthew Whaley Elementary, and I'm honored this evening to introduce this evening's school spotlight. Three of our fifth grade students and master gardener, Ms. Luann Martin, will take you on a tour of a very special place on Matthew Whaley's campus, Maddie's Garden. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the school board. My name is Tabitha Anderson and I'm a fifth grader at Matthew Whaley. 
Maddie's Garden was designed by Gail Roberts as a gift to the community, as a gift to the community for Winsburg Tercentenary Celebration. It came to life between 1997 and 1999 under the guidance of James City County Williamsburg Master Gardeners with help from numerous community groups. The garden was formally dedicated in 1999 in addition to numerous awards. Maddie's Garden is listed on the National Garden Association's Children's Garden Registry and has been featured on the Williamsburg Garden Club's tour. We are so grateful for the community's support to our beautiful garden. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the school board. My name is Jalen Pittman and I am a fifth grader at Matthew Willie. Maddie's Garden is our all-season outdoor classroom. Each month, kindergartners and first graders learn beside the master gardeners as they plant, prune, and harvest flowers, vegetables, and herbs. Miss Brown has turned many of the garden's crops to tasty meals served in our cafeteria. The garden has hosted countless picnics and classroom celebrations. There has been a wedding in the garden, and it's a special place where patriots memorialize beloved members of our community. Every Matthew Willie student has shared in the magic of Maddie's Garden. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the school board. My name is Dominic Wajaya Munoz, and I am a fifth grader at Matthew Whaley. Next month, the Matthew Whaley community will celebrate the 20th anniversary of Maddie's Garden. The Master Gardeners, with support from the community partners and the Matthew Whaley PTA, have been very busy rejuvenating the garden with new raised beds, custom artwork, and an extended alphabet garden. During the garden's anniversary week, our kindergartners will honor the garden with a music performance. The master gardeners will teach garden lessons for students and their families, so the families of our youngest students can experience the joy of the garden. On Saturday, April 26, we will host a special garden celebration, and the Williamsburg community is welcome to tour and enjoy Maddie's garden. We hope you will join us. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the school board. I'm Lou Ann Martin, Master Gardener and Manager of Maddie's. Since becoming a Master Gardener, Maddie's has been very near and dear to my heart. I've played in the dirt, excuse me, soil since a very early age. Jen Rose Lassinger was the music teacher at, Maddie, at the school for 37 years and the first Master Gardener ma Manager of Maddie's. When she asked me to take over as manager, I was honored and thrilled. Maddie's has been invited to be on the annual garden tour and the holiday house tour where we have educated and showcased the garden to visitors who have come as far away as Europe. Maddie's garden shares a very special bond with the community, the school, and its students. It is considered a premier children's garden and a standard for other gardens. We have a dedicated team of master gardeners who work very hard in the garden and with the children. William and Mary students volunteer to work in the garden as a community service. The children truly love the garden, from digging worms, measuring themselves against the banana tree, to watching the monarch butterfly chrysalis on the petunias. These special children are learning valuable lessons which can only be taught as a hands-on experience. We invite you to our 20th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, board members, do we have comments, feedback? Um, so I just want to say thank you to all the master gardeners, the volunteers, um, and the teachers and the staff that make Maddie's Garden so special. Um, I was involved with uh, two of my kids at Matthew Whaley and volunteered for the Roots and Shoots program. And one of my favorite memories was uh, with my sister, we would do this special segment on horse manure. 
<laughs> so, um, and, and it was one of the more interesting um, volunteer activities because we had to jump over and steal horse manure from Colonial Williamsburg, and then we had to mix it, and, and then anyway, it was, and then showing the, the students the value <laughs> of horse manure, and um, but that was just one of my favorite, when I talk about volunteer, uh, that was one of my more unusual volunteer activities that um, I was given the opportunity to to contribute at Matthew Whaley. But the end result also is to see kids, when they pull those carrots out of the ground or they pull the radishes out of the ground and they can, they actually see what, what they've been growing all year long. And then to have Vega Brown, the cafeteria manager, actually make a salad for them where they can eat it. It is just really a wonderful, uh, group, you know, talk about teamwork and integrated project work, it, it, it does all of that and more. So I just wanted to say that it, it was really exciting to hear. <laughs> all came back to me. <laughs> wonderful. Additional comments? Mrs. No, I just think it's wonderful that that uh, has continued for such a long time because so many of those projects get started and, and then you, if you don't have people interested in the community, they, they drop off. So congratulations on keeping this as an ongoing special thing about Matthew Whaley. Let's go. Yeah. I, I too have fond memories of, <laughs> of the garden, um, although not the same as Ms. Hummel's <laughs> memories. Um, but it really did offer an opportunity for, um, for the children at Matthew Whaley to learn um, uh, all sorts of important lessons, but I, I want to especially thank the Master Gardeners for two decades of dedication because um, learning gardens are not easy to maintain. They take tremendous amount of work, much of which take pl takes place when the school's not even in session. So uh, the garden's beautiful, and that takes um, more work than we probably realize. So thank you for that, and I hope, um, Ms. Serza, we can rely on you to get that uh, invitation on our calendars so that um, we can make sure that we can be there. But anyway, thank you very much for being here. Additional comments, sure. Dr. Pierce? Yeah, and, and as all gardeners know, this is an exciting time of the year where perennials are starting to come up and we're getting ready to plant the annuals as well. And um, it's just a, uh, um, it's a wonderful thing to see. And it, and it does really instill, um, I think, in, in um, and uh, kids uh, as well as adults that um, there are things that are uh, continue to grow and come back um, every year and it's uh, and it is a wonderful thing to see and, it, and to help us recognize that we're all part of a, a much bigger a much bigger world and uh, and planting and cultivating and uh, getting your hands into the in the compost is uh, well, there's just no other feeling. What can I say? Anyway, that's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Ms. Taylor? Um, I'm also very impressed by the garden, but even more so impressed by the public speaking of the students. So let's give them another round of applause. That was amazing. Thank you, Ms. Taylor, and I was going to say the same thing. I was very impressed with our speakers and your preparation, and again, I think this is a wonderful example of our community <coughs> partnerships. So thank you for our community partners and for our students and being actively engaged in this um, great project-based learning. So thank you again, Matthew Whaley. Okay, so this we, now brings us to um, citizens' comments. Um, I believe we have seven speakers. I'll turn it over to Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is at this point in our meeting where citizens are invited to address the board. Those citizens, citizens desiring to speak should have submitted speaker cards to the clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. These speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their names for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. It is the board's interest and desire that all comments are heard and respected. Hence, citizens are asked to not engage in applauding, verbal outbursts, or any other type of demonstrations during the presentations. Personnel matters are not considered in public meetings. Therefore, the board requests that all speakers refrain from making reference to specific individuals in any form or fashion. Though the board does not respond to your comments during the meeting, your comments are being heard and appreciated. Each speaker is allocated three minutes to make their presentation, and the board asks that you respect this time limitation. Also, please be reminded that no time may be yielded to another speaker. Your acceptance and adherence to these guidelines will be greatly appreciated, 
Thank you, Madam Chair. My instructions are concluded. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Hummel. Andrew Archbald. Uh, good evening, board members and uh, administration. I'm coming before you today th simply because I am a parent in this district. I'm also a taxpayer here. And I, if what I was told is actually true, um, I have several concerns specifically related towards money and budgeting. So uh, let me first tell you what I've been told, and then I'll kind of tell you why these things concern me. Um, I was first told that uh, there's now going to be five less high school teaching positions for next school year. I've been told that we're purchasing new Algebra One textbooks. Uh, I've been told that there is purchasing new computers for staff members, but that there's going to be a required upgrade for these things to actually work correctly. And that we're being discussing one-on-one -on -one computers for students. Now, why do these things concern me? Uh, first off, high school enrollment's flat. You take five teachers out, that's 500 students. What are you going to do with them? And then I'd also ask, where is that money going? Second thing, the Algebra One textbooks. How many are actually using them? Uh, I've been an educator now for seven years and going on my eighth. And I'll be honest with you, when I taught Algebra One, though the textbooks weren't bad, they weren't great either. You only use it a little bit. I also know that a lot of these teachers are having trouble getting a copier to actually work. Why not take that money and buy a copier? Why not, instead of spending those tens of thousands of dollars on books that probably won't get used very much, spend, I don't know, five grand and buy a copier that will get used? Because keep in mind, though textbooks are great and wonderful, you still want data. You still want the students to be tested. Guess how you make those? The other issue I have with things like new computers, for example, have you ever tried to use the Wi-Fi? Because I've been in these schools. I've seen how this works. I am a member of this community. The Wi-Fi is slow. You want to put new computers on? Great, you should. But from what I hear, the upgrade will also require more things on the network. So you mean to tell me you want to double down on a network that's already slow and you expect it to work? Something about that doesn't quite seem right to me. And then also with talking about students getting one-on-one -on -one computers. I also know what already is going on in Toyano. I have not talked to them to find out how all that actually works. But here's my thought. If the network already doesn't work that great, you now want to add anywhere from, what, 800 to 1,500 new devices to a network that's already slow? How are you going to get any instructional material done? Like, how does that even make sense? So you're basically taking what is my tax dollars and yours, buying all of this stuff. Really, will, will it even work? That sounds like a huge waste of money when you could direct it in other ways that would actually benefit the students. Like, for example, more support staff. Or paying them in a way that you could actually retain them. I noticed that all the teachers of the year were females. What happened to retaining the guys? Thank you, school board. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Kayla, Aaron. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Kayla Aaron. I'm a senior at the College of William Mary, and I'm here with the village tonight. Um, me and other members of the village are here to address a question that was brought up in the last school board meeting of what is a structural barrier? So we're here to address that question tonight. An area that can shed tremendous light on the issue of uh, structural barriers is the racial inequality apparent in discipline rates. Between 2015 and 2018, minority students were consistently overrepresented in short and long-term suspensions. In, 20, in the 2017-2018 school year, students identifying as black, Hispanic, or of two or more races accounted for 68% of the short-term and 79% of the long-term suspensions in WJCC, even though they only made up 38% of the student population in the district as a whole. Looking more specifically at the school level, the numbers are even more striking. In the 2017-2018 school year, black students made up 72% of the short-term suspensions at DJ Montague Elementary, but only 22% of the student population. This trend persists to the high school level. 
In the same year, black students at Lafayette High made up 63% of the short-term and 67% of the long-term suspensions, while only representing 21% of the student population. Now, I impress upon you that these numbers speak not to the failures of the individual students, but to the failure of our school system in educating these groups. This disparity is significant, not only because it keeps minority students out of the classroom, but because it also fuels the school to prison pipeline, wherein students are moved out of public education and into the juvenile and criminal justice system. This is an example of a structural barrier. Research shows that teachers and administrators of color are less likely to expel and suspend students of color because they share a similar lived experience and can meet the students where they are at. In a school system like the WJCC, where the faculty is largely white, you are more likely to see discipline problems. This represents a structural barrier that disadvantages minority students by failing to provide them with culturally competent role models and advantages white students who, who can see role models in their teachers and their administrators who look like them. The Village found this discipline issue particularly relevant after reviewing the budget proposal. Currently, it includes the addition of four security officers at the middle school level. Given that discipline disproportionately affects the WJCC students of color, we urge the board to consider the implications of hiring additional security officers. Instead, we support the hiring of culturally competent teachers and counselors and teachers and counselors of color who can work to incorporate students. Thank you. Thank you. If your remarks are written and you would like to give them to the board clerk, okay, thank you. Well, we'll, she'll share those with us. Jennifer Bickham Mendez. Good evening, school board members. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. My name is Jennifer Bickham Mendez, and I'm a WJCC parent, as well as a supporter and a member of the village. You wouldn't know it from my t-shirt, but I couldn't resist the free advertising. Lafayette High School show of Greece. Opening night is Thursday. Get your tickets. Um, so sorry. Where's the camera? Anyway. <laughs> Along with my colleague, John Rio Frio, I'm currently at William & Mary teaching a new course entitled Marginalized Communities and Education for Transformation. Um, because many of the readings and discussions that we have in class have involved the concept of structural barriers, my ears also pricked up when I watched the last school board meeting. As a sociologist and an educator, I thought it might be useful to provide a quick definition of a structural barrier, as Kayla has done, and then give a couple of quick examples from our class discussions and um, the research. A structural barrier is a condition in place that has disadvantageous impact on a group of students based on their societal position, something over which they have no control as individuals. Structural barriers negatively impact students' ability to succeed and thrive in an educational setting or institution, but they do not affect all students in the same way. Um, that is why it is so important for you as custodians of a public good, our public schools, to understand and consider um, structural barriers. When we are talking about structural barriers, we're talking about inequities with regard to ability, ability to participate in academic achievement. Some quick examples. Ms. Cook gave one um, last school board meeting. When course materials cost additional money in the form of fees, it impacts ed economically disadvantaged students, but those who have students, parents with the means to pay are not impacted in the same way. When information about educationally enriching opportunity goes home with students or is delivered in English only, it means that our English language learner students and their parents may not understand or be able to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, or know to get a permission slip signed, for example. Know what the permission slip is about. This impacts some students, but not others. It's a structural barrier. A shortage of guidance counselors and lack of access to guidance counselors with whom students can effectively communicate has a differential impact on different groups of students because some students rely more heavily on guidance counselors for support in helping them navigate um, uh, life after high school. Um, other uh, students have parents with the means to pay for these kinds of services. The recent 
media spotlight has shown that. These are just a few examples, but there are many more. Does the existence of structural barriers mean that the school board should pay for everything, as was suggested? Is that the only solution? No, but if education is truly public, then it means it should be accessible to all, and we need to recognize and think creatively about these barriers and find best practices and solutions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Amy Clark. Good evening, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Amy Quirk and I am a parent um, and also a member of the Village Initiative. Um, and I want to join my um, other colleagues from the Village to talk about structural barriers. And I want to start with some questions. As a student, if you can think back to when you were a student, did you ever have trouble concentrating on your schoolwork because you were hungry and you were too embarrassed to claim your free lunch or free breakfast? Did you ever feel that a teacher might be perhaps unintentionally underestimating you just based on the color of your skin? These are experiences that many of our students have every day. And these are experiences that are created by structural barriers. So structural barriers in the school system occur because we often unintentionally establish policies and practices and foster attitudes within our schools that are designed to meet the needs and the lived experiences of some of our students, generally our white and more affluent students, and not others, such as our less affluent and minority students. Let me give you some examples. All of our students, our white students, African American, Hispanic, Asian, all of our students have rich and distinct cultures that they um, practice with their families and in their communities. However, in our schools, the curriculum, the institutional culture, the way of operating tends to embrace a white culture. This advantages some students who know how to navigate in that culture, that it's familiar to them, and disadvantages other students um, when, for example, our African American students find that their culture is neglected, dismissed, or relegated to Black History Month. Now, part of this problem is that it not only disadvantages um, our minority students, but it also impoverishes the learning of all of our students. It's these diverse cultures that, and, and dif different lived experiences that challenge our students to develop problem-solving skills and be creative and, and to develop a cultural understanding across differences. And this is related, of course, to the lack of teachers of color who serve as role models and conduits of culture within our schools. I want to give you some statistics. At the James River Elementary School, 66% of the students are minorities, 11% of the teachers are minorities. At Lafayette High School, 45% of, of the students are minorities, 11.5% of the teachers are minorities. Stonehouse, 36% of the students are minorities, only 14% of the teachers. Matthew Whaley Elementary, 54% of the students are minorities, um, just 10% of the teachers are minorities. This is a structural barrier. It is outside of the student's control. And some students, like my son, has lots of role models that relate to him and understand his lived experience. And he's having a fantastic time in kindergarten. But there are minority students that don't have these same role models, don't have these same mentors. This is a structural disadvantage that they're experiencing um, and something we need to address. Thank you. Thank you. Jacqueline Bridgeforth Williams. Sure. We'll um, come back to this. Uh, Ted Maris Wolf. Good evening, Madam Chair and Board. Thank you very much. First, I do want to thank you for everything that you do. You don't have to be here helping to lead us and become a model for Virginia in the country, thank you. Uh, I need to come to more of these meetings because seeing the 17 teachers receive an award reminds me of how many heroes we have around us in our midst. And uh, these teachers truly are heroes. Um, my name is Ted Maris Wolf. I'm a elementary school parent and a Bright Beginnings parent. And tonight I just wanna say a few words about Bright Beginnings. Um, Bright Beginnings teachers are heroes. Their administrators are amazing. And we, the parents, need your help. Because I'm worried about our teachers and administrators in Bright Beginnings. Bright Beginnings 
focuses important resources on the littlest ones. These are the littlest ones, the ones that are going to grow older and articulate the future for us. And the burnout rate of these teachers is extraordinarily high. The resources that they need are great and they are under-resourced. Teachers need more assistance. We need more speech therapists, support staff. We need your help to lead the way. This school system could be a model, not only for Virginia, but for the country. And we need your help to articulate those needs in the community and to raise and direct resources in the direction of bright beginnings. Study after study these days shows us that more investment in the littlest ones pays off in immeasurable ways decades hence. And so I thank you for your service. You are public servants and that's inspiring. And the teachers who are here with us, I thank them for being truly heroes. And the administrators are truly heroic with what they have to do. And please support them. Please lead the way. That's what we want you to do, and we're looking to you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Jacqueline Bridgeforth Williams. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Heron, and members of the school board. I'm Jacqueline Bridgeforth Williams, the founder of the chair and founder of the Village Initiative Incorporated. The Village is a grassroots advocacy organization that focuses on education rights and justice, including addressing the minority achievement gap and advocating for diversity and inclusion within Williamsburg James City County Schools. The Village is made up of concerned citizens from the Williamsburg community to include parents, educators, students, and professionals. Building a positive relationship with our local school system is at the center of the Village's mission and work. The organization has partnered, continued to partner with Williamsburg James City County Schools to develop and Im implement tutoring initiatives to provide this school year over 20 tutors to the schools. And I thank you again for having me um, to come before you. And as the others stated earlier, the village is here tonight just to speak a little bit about structural barriers. Um, my concern is that we integrated 50 years ago, and with that integration, we brought the children in. And the onus was on the children to come into the schools and be our heroes. And, and now what we are asking for is that we bring some of the adults into the schools. We would like to see more um, integration of diversity, of culture, of awareness, of our languages. When you don't bring the adults in, you leave those things out, and they lack. And not only do teachers of color and more diverse staff affect those children, but they they affect all children because we must prepare our children to work and live in a global society. We know that there is a huge achievement gap in Williamsburg James City County Schools that has existed for quite some time. And what we are asking you tonight is to consider those things, the achievement gap, the opportunity gap, the things that lead to the school to prison pipeline. And we do believe that with minority teachers, minority children, not only do we believe it, but the studies support that they're more likely to be identified as gifted students, students with special talents, more so than to be suspended and expelled. So we ask that you continue to consider um, cultural inclusion within our school system. And I thank you this evening for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Rose Roberts. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to also echo some thanks and appreciation for all of you and for our central office staff. Um, in particular, I wasn't able to make it to the last board meeting, but I did watch. And I thought that there were some really great uh, points that were made and conversations that were taking place. Um, I appreciated the support for additional administrators and counselors across the division. Uh, I, the comments made about potentially in the future changing some of our funding structures so that students with 
more needs and schools with more needs are getting more support. Um, and the issue of our high school size inequality, um, which we all know is a problem and we'll figure out a solution for someday. Um, but I also really heard what Dr. Beer said that echoed with me um, that we kind of keep talking and talking about these things and I know that I have done the same in my five years in this division and at some point we need to kind of either do it or stop talking about it because it just keeps getting hashed and hashed and nothing is happening. Um, so over the course of the last couple of weeks, I've taken some time to talk to some of the seniors that I interact with on a regular basis um, because I know that one of the issues that the board has discussed in regards to equity is increasing our AP class enrollment and in particular making those AP course enrollment figures more reflective of the demographics at our schools. Um, so I spoke with, again, these were all seniors, uh, all female, one white, four black, um, varying in mathematical ability, that is what I teach, from Algebra 2 as a senior to pre-calculus to college algebra and the early college program. Um, and they all kind of echoed these four main points that I'm going to share with you today. Um, the first is subsidizing somehow the cost to taking the AP exam. For some students, that really is a structural barrier to being a member of that community academically. Um, they don't know how to do that, you know, they're also only 17 or 18, but they do recognize that some of their friends don't take AP classes because they don't see the point if they know they can't afford the test. Um, some of them also recommended changing the schedule to all AB courses instead of semester four by four. The reason for this is um, a lot of our AP courses are taught um, at the same time. So for instance, the most common one is AP language and AP US history. Um, we would get more students in some of those classes if they didn't have to take both of those at the same time because right now they have to take AP language during fourth block on A days and then they need a B day class and the only other option for them is AP US history on those B days. The other option to that is taking the AP courses in a semester. So one of the students took AP government this fall semester. She's not taking the exam in the spring because she does not feel like she's going to remember anything and wasn't able to prepare. Um, they also echoed a need for more consistent teaching, grading, and work expectations across the AP courses. They felt regularly... Is that my three minutes? Okay. Um, if you'd like to give that to um, the clerk, we'll get it. Kimberly Hundley? I learned something from the little kids that was so cute. Madam Chair and members of the board, I don't always address you all that way. I always come up and say, I'm just Kim Hundley, it's the president. So Madam Chair and members of the board, I'm just here tonight standing on behalf of the teachers as the president of the Teachers Association, standing in full support of the budget. We have talked with Dr. Heron on things we had concerns with, and we think that Definitely the way she is aligning the monies to the strategic goal, that's going to work it out. We thank you for putting in additional staffing for special ed, regular ed, also staffing for um, administrators, um, also uh, counselors. So we think that's a very good fix. And um, I'm really hoping that the budget does fully, uh, is fully funded. Um, also, I am going to speak to the viewing public, if anyone out there is look, listening right now, if you do know of minority teachers or teachers of color that are in universities now, anywhere, you have friends, children, uh, their children, please have them contact Tim Baker. Tell them Kim sent you. We really, you know, and, and then I'm going to issue another challenge. And also, I like what the young man said. If you know men or young men that are in our education programs, please have them contact Williamsburg um, to get an interview. I'm also gonna challenge this. If they're not interested in coming here, can they let us know why? I mean, I've always been interested in that. Is it because um, Northern Virginia pays more? Is it, you know, it's not a good single life here for people uh, that are young? It would be interesting, just let Tim know 
why <laughs> you did not choose to come to Williamsburg. What is it? Because we can't elevate to excellence if we don't know what we need to work on. But I definitely stand for you know, needing more. I'm getting ready to retire next year. I'm hoping the teacher of color comes to take my place. But we need to know why they're not coming or why. Because I feel like we're reaching out. So if there's something we're not doing right, we, we do need to know. Um, I'm going to use my fake Irish accent and say, may the luck of the, the, luck of the Irish help pass the budget. Um, no mad, I know this is mad this month for basketball, but hopefully nothing happens with that, the budget, because it really is, you all, a good budget. This is the first time in my three years as president that it made sense because things lined up, the money lined up to the strategic goals. So we're happy, so hopefully that will pass. Um, spring is here. Your goodies you see are melted because in 20 minutes that's what happened in the car. But not those goodies, the other ones. Yes. So, but thank you for all you do. It is not an easy job. And if anyone is listening out there, please take, take me up on that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hundley. Okay, that brings us to the consent agenda. So the following items will be approved. Item 7.1, approval of minutes from the following meetings, February 19th to March, and uh, February 19th and also March 5th. The financial, uh, item 7.2, the financial report and monthly bills and payroll for February 2019. Item 7.3, personnel actions. Item 7.4, resolution R-7-19, month of the military child. Item 7.5, resolution R-8-19, BSBA business honor roll. Item 7.6, retire policy CHC system of communication. Item 7.7, revise policy GCPC retirement of full-time staff members. And item 7.8, approve release from compulsory attendance case number R20-01. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza? Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Okay, this brings us to the action items. Um, before we move on to item 8.1, I believe Ms. Cook and Mr. Kelly have a statement to read. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, Madam Chair, thank you. As a member of the school board of Williamsburg James City County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2019-2020 school budget because I'm an employee of the Williamsburg Health Foundation. However, I believe I'm able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Madam Chair, as a member of the School Board of Williamsburg, James City County, I have an interest in the fiscal year 2019-2020 school budget because my wife is an employee of the WJCC schools. However, I believe I'm able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Thank you. So, item 8.1, um, approve the FY20 operating budget. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve the fiscal year 2020 budget the amount of $142,513,126 to include $103,916,391 for instruction, $4,906,532 for student attendance and health, $3,696,651 for administration, $8,943,000 $952 for public transportation services, $12,822,990 for operation and maintenance services, and $8,226,610 for technology. And that, that would be add, add up to $142,513,126 that we are requesting from our funding partners. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Is there a second for that request? Second. Discussion. Cook? Um, yeah, I would just like to say that, um, as I said at the last meeting, I, I do support this budget as it's presented. And um, as many people have remarked, I particularly appreciate the alignment with our strategic goals. 
Um, I do want to speak very briefly to um, my support of uh, adding security officers at the at the middle school. While I um, appreciate and understand the perception or belief that um, that might add to uh, to uh, further discipline, uh, I think the point of that is to extend the administration's ability to. Um, to have coverage at after school events. Our middle schools do have um, athletic events and uh, fewer assistant principals and so, uh, or, or currently, and so next year that will allow them, at the high school level I believe there's three security officers and so even, even so with adding one security officer at each middle school the, the, that administrative team will still be pretty thin. So I think it's really about um, coverage at after school events, plays, sporting events, uh, uh, um, is that correct, Dr. Heron? So I just wanted to say that that's why I support that. And then also, um, after we adopt this, Madam Chair, I, am, I would like to request or at least discuss with the board, um, we have gotten into uh, the habit the last two years with our CIP request of sending it directly to our funding partners with a cover letter from the chair that sort of explains the, the, the top line uh, goals and, um, and, and talks a little bit of, of about forecasting. And I, I think, I wonder if it's time, I, and I think it is time to extend that practice to the operating budget request. And I, I wonder if you would be willing to write a cover letter, letter um, kind of highlighting the key points and forecasting for future years, explaining to our funding partners so that they know what to expect in the out years in terms of our strategic goals. I think that's a great idea. Okay. Yes. Mr. Kelly? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to jump off from where Ms. Cook was on the security officers, the security officers are not police officers. They're, st they're school system employees, so they, um, they are not... Uh, encumbered with the burdens of being law, law enforcement officers and having to deal with um, with that aspect of it. There are several parts of this budget that um, I, I definitely appreciate. Um, five full-time equivalents for school counselors I think is great. Four percent average salary increase uh, for our our entire staff I think is, uh, is very good. Uh, social studies coordinator for a community that's very much involved in history um, and social studies, I think, is, is also very important. Um, additional staffing at Bright Beginnings, I think, is also um, uh, a, a good part of this budget. Um, and as we, rec as we said, this is a recommendation to our funding partners. This is not our budget yet. Uh, our funding partners are, will, have, will have their um, opportunity to, to weigh in on the amount of money that uh, that they, have avail that they have available to fund us, and then we have, might, may have additional decisions to make after that. Um, you know, I think it's important to note, for instance, you know, when, uh, when the General Assembly says that they're, they're providing for additional school counselors, um, the way the funding works here in Williamsburg, James City County, is they're providing for a third of that cost, and the, the locality has to provide the other two-thirds. Um, when they say they're providing or you know, salary increases for for staff, they're providing a third of standard of quality teachers, not um, for our entire staff. So uh, there's there's a little bit of a mixed message that comes out of Richmond that's a little bit deceptive. Um, whether it's intentional or not, we can we can debate. But um, this budget gets us back on uh, on a on a good path. We're not exactly everywhere we want to be. We're not exactly everywhere we should be. Um, but I think it's definitely steps in the right direction, and I appreciate the, uh, the superintendent's work in putting this together and her staff, Mrs. Ewing, and uh, the rest of the administration for uh, working to put this together and uh, provide for what I think is a, a good budget for this community. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Are there additional comments? Yeah, the only thing I would add is that um, our, <clears throat> our joint session with our governing bodies um, I thought the uh, presentation and the explanation of the key elements of our budget were uh, very well um, uh, spelled out. Uh, and I want to thank our staff, our administration, uh, for uh, their diligence and their ability to do that. We were also reminded by uh, 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 Supervisor McLennan that 10 years ago, 
state gave um, this school district $33 million. Today, or last year, it's been about 10 years, um, we got $35 million. Think of all the changes that have occurred in our community, in our school system in the last 10 years, and they only bumped us up $2 million. So, um, uh, and that leaves the burden on financing um, this wonderful school system uh, on our uh, governing bodies. And, uh, and I know that they will consider very carefully um, our budget request and, um, uh, and, uh, and I hope they approve it. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Ms. Hummel? Um, I just wanted to say to follow up on Dr. Beers' comment about the joint session that uh, in that session, we covered uh, the fact that over 80% of our budget is for instructional purposes. That's where it should be. That's uh, the heart of everything we do in the WJCC system. And for me, what was really impactful was the fact that we need to attract and retain our excellent teachers and staff in our school system. And when you look at all of the comparison charts that were showed um, to our funding partners, we are, despite all of our excellent accredited schools, we are at the bottom as far as salary goes. And um, so for for me, it's not only salary, but it was the number of assistant principals, the number of security guards, the number of counselors. And we are doing so much with so little that for me personally to, to and then when the, the village um, representatives come tonight and they talk about we need to hire more minority teachers, a very important part of all of that is making sure that the salaries that we're offering are competitive, that um, we are not overburdening our teachers with overcrowded classes. So uh, I think that our budget is is a good budget and I hope that our funding partners um, agree and uh, will support support it. So, I guess I just want to um, piggyback on what uh, has been mentioned. Uh, the the one thing that, um, as a former teacher, retaining our teachers is so vital. And there is, I think, this budget has started to address that, uh, thanks to HR and and. Uh, um, Ms. Ewing for um, presenting the things that we as a school division are trying to work on. Uh, we would like more minority teachers, so thank you, Ms. Huntley, for uh, inviting people to, to contact Mr. Baker. I'm sure he would love to get those phone calls. Uh, we would like more minority teachers. We would like uh, our school staffs to be more representative of our community. And uh, so, Along with uh, our efforts to increase the bottom line for salary, we're not there yet. We're trying to get there. And I would want to thank our, uh, our uh, funding partners at the joint meeting uh, last Friday when, when Ms. Ewing presented that, that that point was brought home that we need to keep and retain our excellent teaching staff. And, um, and I guess that if there's anything that needs to be cut this year, it will, I hope, it, and I, I would never vote for cutting teacher salary. We, we should be increasing, and uh, if need be, we may have to take some cuts elsewhere, but that would not be an area I would hope that we would, uh, that we would consider touching. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Young. Taylor? Um, I, I also support the budget um, this evening. I think it's the first step in the right direction of many steps to come. Um, as we continue working to better the division. And in regards to security guards that were mentioned, um, as someone who's in the schools quite frequently, um, uh, it is of note that many of our students develop very positive relationships with the security <coughs> guards at the high school level. So I'm excited to see what it will bring to the dynamic at the middle school level as well. So I'm prepared to support this tonight. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. 
Um, I just wanted to share that um, the board recognizes that the um, budget that is presented to our funding partners does have a shortfall, but we are required to present a budget of need, and that is what we have presented. Um, this budget does allow for a multi-year approach um, to shore up, as, as, as my board colleagues have said, um, uh, compensation for our teachers, staff, and administrators, and to make us more competitive um, in the region and to move our regional rankings up just a bit. Um, we stated last year as a board that we needed to take a multi-year approach with regard to compensation, hiring more special education teachers and more English language learners. And so last year we were able to make some inroads. And so in order for, as a division, for us to continue to do that, we must, we must continue. And so this budget that we're requesting um, allows us to begin to move forward. Um, it allows for us to employ, as my colleagues have said, the much needed guidance counselors that are now mandated by the General Assembly, but not fully funded by the General Assembly. Um, as, per, as per our board's um, standard operating procedure, we are responsible for advocating for this budget, as well as for engaging the broader community and our education advocates. And so um, I encourage our education partners, the Teachers Association, the Special Education Advisory um, Committee, PTAs, PTSAs, and other education advocates to engage in this budget process, which now moves on to um, the city and our county um, to make decisions about uh, this request that we have made. So unless there are additional comments, um, Ms. Serza, call the vote. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Okay, moving on to item 8.2, approved WJCC Schools Foundation donation for innovative <coughs> learning grants. I'm, I move that we approve uh, the WJCC Schools Foundation donation for innovative learning grants in the amount of $34,575.77. And is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, Ms. Serza? <coughs> Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Um, item 8.3, award a contract to resurface the athletic track at Warhill High School. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I move to award a contract to resurface the athletic track at Warhill High School to Centennial Contractors in the amount of $472,609.40. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Ms. Ombi? Aye. Item 8.4, award a contract for invitation for bid number 19-13721, window replacement at Norwich Elementary School. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we award a contract for invitation for bid number 19-13721, window replacement at Norwich Elementary School to David A. Nice, or Nice, uh, Builders Incorporated in the amount of $105,900. Thank you, Ms. Young. And is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. Any discussion? Mrs. Cook. Um, because some funds are being transferred uh, from the fund balance, I just wanted to ask if how, how that's doing, how healthy is our fund balance? Funds left over in the Norge HVAC project that will be transferred to cover. Thank you. Any additional questions, comments? Ms. Serza. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Item 8.6, approve middle school student technology refresh. Your motion. Madam Chair, I move we award a contract for invitation for bid number 19-13722 electrical equipment replacement at Lafayette High School to Luxterra Electrical in the amount of $179,914. You skipped one. I skipped one. Yep. But that's the one that she should have done, so I'll second that. Thank you. <laughs> Any discussion? So, 
we'll come back to that. So we're gonna. Uh, no, we no. just she just she just moved for eight point zero five. Okay. She did I apologize. Oh, well, there it goes. It doesn't listen. She to did what she was supposed it's to okay. do. That's right. Do what you're <laughs> supposed to do. Okay. There's been a second. Is there any discussion of action item eight point five? Award a contract for invitation for bid 1913-722 electrical equipment replacement Lafayette. All question. Ms. Thurza, sorry, I checked it off. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Prematurely. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Okay, now item 8.6, approve middle school student technology refresh. Madam Chair, I move approve of purchase request of laptops for middle school student use uh, to Lenovo in the amount of $462,451. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Mr. Landers, just to make sure, this is a refresh, so it's, we're not adding additional uh, devices to the unit, to the network. It's, uh, we're taking some out and putting new in to maintain our one-to-one -one ratio at the middle school level. That's correct, sir. These will be replacing units that are falling off warranty and aging out of our inventory, sir. They are replacements, not additions. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions, Ms. Young? Uh, Mr. Landers, uh, thank you for answering that. We're, we're not, as you just stated, we're not adding new computers. This is just the refresh. But I do have a question about bandwidth. Um, it was mentioned earlier tonight about Wi-Fi is slow um, uh, at our schools, what is our bandwidth for these for these schools? Is or do we keep bandwidth up to date? Uh, yes, ma'am, we do. Uh, currently, we are one gig to the internet, and we're uh, 100 megabytes each device internally. We are upgrading that this summer. Uh, we're not sure yet, but it will either be five gig or 10 gig to the internet, and we have a number of projects to upgrade our wireless access points, as well as our closet switches to increase our capabilities within the schools. Okay. So how is it upgraded? Is I'm sorry? It, how is it upgraded? Is, does that involve... Um, adding more wires, I'm, you can tell I'm not, I'm not anywhere near where you are, but I'm it, just trying to understand what that involves. It involves a couple of things. Um, the switches in, in the closets in the buildings, they provide the throughput for the bandwidth. So we're upgrading those to a higher throughput level, higher capability level. Uh, the wireless access points in the ceilings, those are how the individual uh, laptops connect to our network. We're also upgrading them, again, to improve the throughput, the bandwidth capabilities of each of our wireless access points. And so will that in increase the speed for the... Our, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. As, as we add throughput and bandwidth, it increases the speed for the devices. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any additional questions? Ms. Serza. Ms. Cook. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Ombi. Aye. Um, item 8.7, approve internal firewall appliance purchase. I move that we approve the purchase request for internet firewall appliance to CW, CDW Incorporated in the amount of $198,772.20. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? None. Ms. Serza? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Ombi? Aye. Item 8.8, .8, approve revisions to school board standard operating procedure. Madam Chair, I move that we approve revisions to school board standard operating procedures. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Serza? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Ombi? Aye. And lastly, item 8.9, revised policy BDDHKD public participation of school board meetings. Madam Chair, I move approve, we approve revisions to policy BDDH. KD public participation at school board meetings. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? We had some discussion about this at the, at the work session, and uh, Ms. Serza worked out some changes that were uh, 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 
appropriate and acceptable. So I thank you for your efforts there. Additional comments? Ms. Terza? Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Zombie? Aye. Okay, moving on to um, item nine, information items, um, 9.1, equity through engagement, preparing students to be career, college, and life ready. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're excited this evening to present some information about how we are preparing students to be career, college, and life ready. Dr. Worley will be setting off the presentation this morning and joining her at the podium are Ms. Parker and Ms. Thrift, who are part of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Worley. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school board, and Dr. Heron. Liz Parker, our coordinator of school counseling, Sherry Thrift, our division career coach, and I are thankful for the opportunity to provide you with an update on the work we are doing to prepare all students for a successful future. Our focus supports the expectations of the Virginia Department of Education and the profile of a Virginia graduate. It is our goal to ensure that all students leave WJCC schools with skills necessary to be career and college ready, and most importantly, to be life ready. As we share some of the amazing things happening in our schools, you will see that this work supports our division strategic plan, as well as our initiatives to prepare our students for post-secondary opportunities. The Virginia profile of a graduate outlines a path to prepare our students through curriculum, hands-on activities, opportunities to experience real work, and career opportunities. The ability to demonstrate the five C's, to be creative, to collaborate, to think critically, to communicate, and to be responsible citizens engaged in society are all expectations for our students. Employers and colleges share that these skills, along with the ability to take initiative and to problem solve, are paramount for success. This slide is a picture overview of the life ready graduate as highlighted in the profile of a Virginia graduate. Through this work, we will give students access to content knowledge with the ability to apply learning. We foster the development of productive workplace skills and behaviors. We facilitate the opportunity for students to build community connections and finally identify a career path that is directly connected with their strengths, skill sets, and interests. The profile of a Virginia graduate directly supports the goals highlighted within our division strategic plan. Specifically, goal one, academic achievement, college and career readiness, goal two, educational equity, and goal three, communication and engagement. And now Liz Parker will begin the discussion regarding implementation in our schools. Good evening. Like any area of development, career development is sequential and builds over time. WJCC believes that career and college readiness is a K-12 initiative, and beginning the process at the elementary level can assist students in making critical connections between current education and future success. At the elementary school level, students begin to understand the concept of a career in kindergarten, and our focus is on career awareness and exposure. This time is also critical for developing goals and understanding the value of lifelong learning. As we move into the middle school years, our focus shifts into a more depth career exploration and planning, and students start to identify and demonstrate the relationship of personal interests, goals, and course planning as it relates to career choices. And at the high school level, the goal is for students to understand how the changing workplace requires lifelong learning flexibility, and the acquisition of new employment skills through a narrowed career focus and work-based learning experiences. Let's look at some specific WJCC initiatives occurring at each level. In elementary school, our students are introduced to Virginia Career View, which is the Commonwealth's online career information delivery system. Many of these features and functions are available in languages other than English, and this is at no cost to any of our students. All students K-5 through five receive core counseling lessons and work-ready classroom visits from the school counselor each month, which includes a focus on career development as well as the social-emotional skills and non-cognitive factors that we know are critical for student success in school, the workforce, and in life. 
In upper elementary years, students are introduced to the concept of career clusters and spend some time becoming aware of the 16 different types of career clusters. In fourth grade, 100% of WJCC students complete their very first interest inventory, the ONET Interest Profiler, online to begin to find out what their interests are, how they relate to the world of work, and what types of careers they might like to start exploring. Also in fourth grade, 100% of WJCC students begin the creation of their online academic career plan portfolio through Office 365's OneDrive, which they will continue to update and maintain through both middle and high school. Additionally, each elementary school holds at least one culminating career event annually. These range from your more traditional career days and career fairs to maybe more frequent career cafes and careers on wheels, and most recently, career wax museums, which we will get the chance to see firsthand in just a moment. Furthermore, to assist students in beginning with the end in mind, elementary school counselors have begun to incorporate college campus tours, both virtual and in person, into their annual programs for fifth grade students. Here you see WJCC fifth grade students visiting Christopher Newport University, where they experienced college student-led tours throughout the campus. They had the opportunity to sit in lecture halls, they checked out dorm rooms, and to eat lunch in a college dining hall, which was by far their favorite part of the afternoon. <laughs> Totally, um, in WJCC, 70% of WJCC's elementary schools visit a college campus in person. Last year and this year, we we're aiming to increase this to 100%. Here we illustrate a small sample of the different types of counseling lessons and activities that go on at the elementary level for all students in all of our ninth grade, or all of our nine elementary schools. And here you get a glimpse of the culminating career events taking place annually at each of our nine elementary schools. These hands-on opportunities are essential ways to engage students during the most formative years of career development. And we'll see one of those up close. So the Career Wax Museum, this is our first time. I hope it will be an annual event. The kids are doing a wonderful job. What they have done, we've been, the fifth graders have been working on this for the last three months. We went into the media center where the librarian allowed us to do all of our research and having them research one or two of the careers that they were most interested in based on their interest survey. And that was based on the 16 career clusters that is part of the, uh, the whole career program. They've really worked so very hard. I turned it into something a little more fun because the fourth graders are the ones who are being able to push the buttons and hear the characters come alive. Um, we had engineers, we had singers, we had military, we had artists. We had a, just a variety. We have done so much in doing career readiness within Matthew Whaley. We took our fifth graders to um, Christopher Newport University early on. That kind of was our kickoff start to get them thinking about careers. The goal of a profile of a graduate, career readiness, is truly to make them life ready. And so this is a K through 12 initiative and this is Truly, I go into classes beginning in kindergarten, but this is kind of a culminating activity for them in fifth grade to really get them thinking about not only their interests, their strengths, but whether they, what they need to do to go forward to make this their, their dream job happen. Now we'll move on to the middle school years. In middle school, all WJCC middle school students are introduced to and provided a free account for Virginia Wizard, which is the Commonwealth's online career information delivery system for secondary schools. Beginning in sixth grade and continuing through eighth grade, all middle school students receive core counseling lessons in their classrooms that include a deeper focus on career clusters and career pathways and further development of those key social, emotional, and workplace readiness skills. Classroom lessons also include students playing the game Imagine through Virginia Wizard. Imagine is a lifestyle budgeting game specific to Virginia's economy, which allows students to walk through expenses they will incur each month, 
decide how much to spend on their chosen lifestyle, determine their minimum salary needs, and use this information to help them evaluate their post-secondary and career interests, and it is incredibly fun for them to do. 100% of seventh grade students take a career interest and work values assessment through Virginia Wizard to assist them in narrowing down their career focus and then connect those results to careers and post-secondary opportunities that match. 100% of our seventh grade students also develop an academic career plan in seventh grade, which is a flexible plan that outlines an individualized program of study through high school graduation for each student based on their own post-secondary goals. In an effort to expand students' understanding and awareness of educational and technical training opportunities in high school, WJCC partners with <coughs> New Horizons Career and Technical Education Center to host a career day on site for 120 interested eighth grade students from all four middle schools. Additionally, in middle school, a deeper dive into each of the 16 career clusters and related pathways is provided to students through a middle school career investigation curriculum. Here you see WJCC middle school students learning firsthand about New Horizons career and technical education programs such as culinary arts, welding, and electrical, as well as hearing from a local attorney and a former NA NAACP prosecutor during one of the division's middle school career day events. This year, two of four of our middle schools hosted a career day for all students in grades six through eight, and this program is expected to expand to all four middle schools next year. And in high school, we sharpen our focus on courses and activities that provide students with the knowledge, skills, and attributes they must possess upon graduation to be successful in freshman level college courses, career training or apprenticeship programs, the military, or the workforce. In regards to activities, this year WJCC hosted its sixth annual Manufacturing Day in partnership with the Association for Manufacturing Excellence and James City County. Over 125 high school sophomores, juniors, and seniors from all three high schools had the opportunity to tour two local modern day manufacturing facilities. This event again is offered at no cost to students, transportation is provided, all students receive a free lunch, and any student in 10th through 12th grade are welcome to register. All 9th, and 12th, 9th through 12th grade students and families also have the opportunity to attend WJCC's annual College and Career Night, a division-wide event held in partnership with the Virginia Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admission Officers and the James City County Office of Economic Development. This event hosts more than 100 colleges and universities, professional programs, businesses, and branches of the military, and includes multiple workshop sessions on financial assistance for post-secondary education. This event is also free to students and families, is on the Route 4 Purple Bus Line, and offers translation services on site. To assist all students with the focus on to assist all of our students, but with a focus on students from underrepresented populations in discovering career opportunities in law and exploring post-secondary paths to pursue a legal education, WJCC also partners with William & Mary Law School through a grant from the Law School Admission Counselor to provide an opportunity for 75 high school students from all three schools to participate in a program called Discover Law. This event is also at no cost to students, transportation, and lunch is provided, and any WJCC high school student is welcome to register. Dr. Worley will now share some of the division's new course initiatives at the high school level. All three high schools explored options for innovation through grants awarded through the Virginia Department of Education. As a result of this work, teachers and administrators from all three high schools collaborated under the leadership of Assistant Principal Michelle Newcomb to identify best practices, successes, and to identify courses best suited to support our work across all three schools. We now have eight Commonwealth Innovation courses in the 2019-2020 Program of Studies. It was a beautiful experience to see the work of amazing teachers coming together from all three high schools to discuss lessons learned and agree upon the best combination of courses for WJCC. Our innovation committee brought the work of Pathways at Warhill, Link 5 at Lafayette, and Concourse 9 at Jamestown to develop a unified curriculum at all three schools. The content and projects from courses across all three schools were used to create innovative opportunities for students. The new courses are identified as Commonwealth Innovation Courses. This name was created by our Innovation Committee and gives credit to the VDOE for their support of our work with innovation grants. In addition to our increase in cross-content innovative curriculum, we are working to increase opportunity, eliminate barriers, 
and support students as they enroll in advanced placement or AP courses in our division. During the 2017-18 school year, we instituted a division-wide AP Hack Task Force to implement strategies for AP success. This year, Assistant Principal Justin Throop is leading this work. Some highlights are the use of AP potential data from the PSAT to identify students who have the potential to succeed in AP coursework. This allows schools to connect with individuals who are not currently enrolled in AP or who have not selected AP courses during the course selection process. Schools are using phone calls, postcards, and other methods to encourage these students. We also have an AP potential breakfast at all three high schools. We invite students to learn about opportunities in AP and to hear testimony from students. Another support system implemented as a result of this task force is our booster shot sessions to help students prepare and utilize skills and strategies necessary to succeed in AP. You will now hear a short testimony from Kara Green, a junior at Warhill High School who used the booster shot sessions to help her succeed in her first advanced placement courses. I'm taking AP US History, AP French, and AP Language. I'm taking AP classes because I want to be able to challenge myself and to learn more about or well, get in depth into each subject that I'm learning and to be able to better myself as a student. I signed up for an AP booster session because I wanted to know how I can manage my time because I know AP classes, the it requires a lot of work, and for me being an athlete, playing two different seasons, it's hard for me to be able to do a lot of work and play. So for me, I thought that it would be a good opportunity for me to be able to know when I can manage my time and how I can manage my time. And now Sherry Thrift will continue to highlight our work at the high school level. Um, to expand upon the opportunities that Ms. Parker mentioned previously, this spring we'll be adding a resume writing and interviewing component into the economics and personal finance class. Students will complete a resume, learn interviewing skills and etiquette, and also participate in mock interviews. As a division career coach, I work with school counselors to assist high school students with career assessments and research, college and career options, resume assistance, FAFSA and college application guidance, and more. This assistance is available to all high school students with many students I see representing underserved populations. Starting with the next school year, career and college resource information from the three high schools will become centralized into an easier to navigate web page accessible to all students through our division website. Resources will include scholarships, career experience opportunities like job shadowing and internships, links to career assessments, upcoming career and college related events, and much more. Can't turn the page here. Um, our next important effort is our partnership with James City County Economic Development and Thomas Nelson Community College on a workforce resources committee to look at workforce needs in our area. Needs are being assessed through a survey of local employers and data from local, state, and national organizations and data providers. Through this work, we hope to ensure that we are preparing our students for careers in sectors that are growing at both the local and the national level. We are also identifying the soft skills that employers see as crucial to the workplace now and in the future. We started with the healthcare sector, and after survey data was collected and analyzed, we held a healthcare workforce summer earlier this month with 53 people in attendance from the healthcare field. Through this information gathered from the Survey Data and Summit, we will look at ways WJCC schools can ready our students for the healthcare field through implementation of additional healthcare pathways and career experiences. Relatedly, we are exploring the opportunity to partner with Thomas Nelson Community College on a grant-funded opportunity through the Claude Moore Foundation to increase opportunities for students to participate in dual enrollment health career pathways. Additional career experience opportunities that we are um, doing in our high schools. This past fall, we had three students, one from each of our high schools, participate in a paid 30-hour internship with our division's IT department through the Go Virginia Cyber Alliance Initiative. 
And also, this is the first year that our division is participating in the NASA HUNT program. If you're wondering what HUNT means, it's HUNT, it stands for High School Students United with NASA to Create Hardware. So these students are working with our local NASA agency, in this case it's Langley, to create products for the International Space Station. The students have been working on a spare tool spout, tools pouch product and just completed the critical design review at Langley two weeks ago. Just last week, we learned that the WJCC team received an invitation to the national competition at the Johnson Space Center in Texas in April. This spring, in partnership with the James City County Police Department, we will be offering a Pathways to Law Enforcement program for high school upperclassmen. Students will learn about the field, what they look for in an applicant, and the next steps they can take after they graduate from high school. Lastly, we are building the structure and framework for students to participate in job shadowing and internships with local employers. And in addition to Manufacturing Day, over the next year, our division will hold additional career events, including Health Careers Day, Engineering and Trades Night, and Hospitality and Tourism Career Day. Over to you, Kathy. So, uh, as you can see, we are collaborating as a division to facilitate rich, meaningful, and real-life opportunities for all students to explore career pathways of interest. We realize that students need a certain skill set whether they go to college, take AP courses in high school, go to work, join the military, go to community college or a trade school. They must be able to communicate, collaborate, think critically, and be creative in order to succeed. We are proud of our staff and the commitment they have to support career exploration for all students. Tonight, you have heard a great deal of information from us. We now provide you the opportunity to hear from our students. So after I'm done with school, I would like to be a pediatrician. I'm most interested in the arts career cluster. Um, I love theater, especially musical theater, so I'm going down that theatrical path. Uh, the career cluster that I am interested in is education with a focus in arts. Um, I would say that I'm most interested in the health and science or the education and training career clusters. The pathway and career cluster that I'm most interested in is anything having to do with creativity and art, which is probably why I'm in the cosmetology class, because it gives me room to work with my hands. Um, the career cluster and pathway that I was most interested in was the, the law, public safety, and corrections. Um, the career cluster I'm most interested in is computer engineering. I really like it because it mixes hardware design and also some computer science principles, which are two things I'm really interested in. What I'm interested in, basically, it would be like artistic, enterprising, and investigative. It would be really fun to be an author, honestly, because I like writing books and drawing little doodles. This concludes our presentation this evening. We'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I'll start with this. Questions? Yeah, I just would like to know what was with the goat that was, <laughs> that was in that one slide, if there was a goat. Um, that was in the early... Or the elementary? Yes. Yeah, so it was probably veterinary sciences. I, that I figured as much, yeah. but I, I, goats are known for eating about anything. I'm surprised <laughs> some class. They brought a variety of animals with them, so that was just one that they, that they brought. But. Okay, I, I guess one of the things that um, impressed me is that we're already taking um, elementary kids to, to universities to tour. Um, I think it might be more difficult to do a trade school, but I think that might be really valuable. And I think at one point I had spoken to Mr. Snipes about maybe having elementary kids coming out to uh, operations and, and touring some of their facilities because it's pretty awesome yes. there. Um, but anyway, thank you for doing this and uh, cer certainly near and dear to my heart to have kids have a good idea of what, where they're going so that when they walk out that door at the end of 12th grade, they're, they're headed somewhere and they're not in a tizzy realizing, hey, wait a minute, school just ended, now what? <laughs> yes. So thank you so much. Ms. Young, Ms. Taylor? Yes. Um, you're right, beginning with the end in mind is so important with our kids and, and keeping up the motivational aspects of school and having this flexible blueprint to work from is so important for them. So thank you for sharing this with us. 
Um, so hearing from all of you tonight and looking at the middle, you know, elementary, middle, high school progression and all of the work that goes behind the scenes to pull off these kind of um, events, I'm like really, really happy that the school board is putting more money into our school counselors. So, you know, thank you guys for this. Uh, also, I just kind of, this is kind of a question because I know that it was a requirement for uh, the 85% um, the 80 20 80 20 direct counseling services direct counseling for s services and i just wondered for our viewing public how does that fit into all of the time that's involved in in pulling off these big events so that's just kind of a question yeah that's a great question so a lot of what we do um, is through classroom core counseling curriculum and so that's also a direct service it's working with students from a counseling curriculum in large group settings okay and then taking them to activities and things of that nature also falls under direct services oh good so, yeah. okay so mm -hmm. because i just was like this, this these are wonderful things yeah. that you're doing it would actually increase their time to spend on college and career development as well as the social emotional skills that we know are critical for students to be successful once they do leave us. Okay. Thanks. Ms. Cook. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I really appreciate this presentation tonight and, um, and your thoughtful approach, Kate, to 12. It really helps me understand your thinking um, from uh, through to follow a student as they uh, mature. I particularly like the addition of the resume writing and the interviews. That's, I think that's going to be um, a, a measure the, that'll benefit the kids immeasurably, I think. And looking forward to seeing the website. That sounds really cool. And I really appreciated seeing the, the, the students on the video because seeing people that age being able to articulate their interests gives me hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just leave, leave it at that. Um, and, I, and I don't expect you to answer this now because I know this is new and um, you're, you know, you're the architect of this and it, you're still implementing it. Um, but I do wonder how we'll know that this is working. How we know that, that students are internalizing it and not just going through the motions um, as they consider their future. I think starting earlier when kids are still in, more engaged in, in school, the research tells us the older they get, the less. And that's why you're, you created the Commonwealth in, you know, Innovation Courses to try to engage students more. But um, again, you don't have to answer this now, but I, I am curious how we will know as kids age and they start to narrow their interests, how we will know that it's working as they simultaneously become a little less engaged in school. Hopefully we're fixing that, but yes. um, we, we, that's, we're, you know, we're swimming upstream there. So um, anyway, that's, that's what I'm going to be curious about in a little while. Thank you. Dr. Beers? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, actually, I think the answer will be, <coughs> do they get jobs when they, uh, when they <laughs> yeah. finish up? But that's how we're going to gonna find out. Anyway, <coughs> that's actually, um, <coughs> I very much appreciate, I, I have a much better sense now of, of how the clusters work, how the pathways work, um, how the different elements of parts of it go together um, as it relates to career readiness. Uh, a question, and, and again, um, you may or may not have the answer for this yet, but I think it's a question that uh, we're gonna have to figure out how to answer sometime in the future. Every conference that I've gone to the last year or so where there's discussion about the workforce, about um, job possibilities, um, uh, career choices. One of the things that I hear over and over again is uh, several things. One of them is the jobs that we may be preparing students for are not gonna be there when they graduate. That's number one. The other one is, um, and there's loads of data to support this, uh, many of our young people, many of our old people, um, have gone through or done 10, 15 different jobs over the course of their lifetime. And they're not the same jobs. Um, so I guess what, and, I, and Dr. Worley, you touched on it, and I wonder, maybe that's what I'm talking about, is what, what are the, what are the critical skill sets. There are obviously skill sets for every single one of these career paths. 
but what do you think are, what are the critical um, skill, uh, key skills that every student should have regardless of what pathway they take as they go on into, you know, post um, education and life? Dr. Beers, I think the heart of that work starts with the five C's that we were discussing and we're embedding in curriculum. Our, our students need to know how to collaborate, communicate, be creative, creative. We want them to be productive citizens. And we, we do a lot, that's why a lot of the work we do in the classroom with the teams and working together. Um, and learning to take initiative, to explore on their own, to be creative, those are all components of what our employers and our colleges are saying are gonna help students with success. Because, as you just said, we don't know the jobs that we're, we're preparing our students for because they change, they change every day and what the world is doing when a, a kid walks into kindergarten is going to be drastically different when they graduate in 12th grade. So teaching them that skill set where they're able to communicate and learn and take initiative on their own and work with others is one, a, a good starting point to make sure our students are successful. Problem solving, all, all those yes. kinds. Yes, critical yeah. thinking. Good, okay, because <laughs> I really, um, you know, I think the career paths are fabulous, are great, but I think at the heart of every single one of them are going to be those, uh, that, that skill set. Good, glad to hear it. Thank you, Dr. Beers, Mr. Kelly. I was hoping Mrs. Roberts would stand up and say math, but that's another story. <laughs> um, it, when you start looking at uh, um, you know, preparing, preparing students to, after graduation, you can't start early enough, and starting in K through five, and, and giving, those, giving those students a focus for the future kind of gives them purpose and I think helps with their engagement in their, in their learning so that they know that, you know, I'm learning this algebra because I'm, you know, I I'm, could be using this when I go, go to engineering school <laughs> <laughs> or become a teacher. So, um, and, I, and I appreciate the diversity of the, of the, prof of the professions that we have because I think that's also important to give, to, to understand the, 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 the spectrum that's out there and, you know, and, and I, think, I think a lot of these, you know, how many, how many people change majors when they go through college? I mean, and so they, 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 get, the, they get a broad spectrum, get exposure to a lot of different careers, and it, and it helps them to, as they, make, as they go forward their decision process. So I, I just think this is, uh, this is great. We may, never have, we may never have metrics to show us how, if it's successful or not, but some things you just have to believe, and I, I really believe that this is the right thing to do, so. Dr. Kelly? Um, and I wanted to share, I guess, for the listening public that um, our approach to career readiness has been a process. And so as our division has responded to changes passed down from the state with regard to the portrait of a graduate, we've tweaked and changed things. And so I know that we, a couple years ago, rolled out um, a career investigation class at the middle school, and we've tweaked that and changed that and have, you know, identified what is best practice and what works. And so this is an evolving process, and so it's exciting to see how it changes every year. Um, I know that we've, we are now really um, encouraging students to do the early college program, and so originally Originally, that was for students who were just on the advanced studies path, but now we've opened that up to students who are doing the standard diploma as well. So again, just for the listening public to understand that it, it's evolving every year. Um, but then I did, I had a couple specific questions, if I could ask two. So with regard to the innovation courses across the three high schools, and you, and you might not have this information tonight, but does it, does, what does that look like in terms of students' enrollment? Like have, 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 have there been several or all of these courses available at all three high schools? Has there been certain courses that make it other course, high schools and not others? <laughs> They're finishing their course request process now as we speak and we're starting to tally those um, numbers. We, if the requests show, they will run at schools. We don't expect that every course will run at every school the first um, year or two. We hope to grow that, and we're really um, excited about the collaboration of the teachers from all three schools because they all were a part of developing the courses and you know making sure that projects that they fell in love with and their content were kind of blended in in the appropriate places. So we will be monitoring that, and we can get those numbers to you. That would be great. Okay. And I have a couple other questions. Um, so as Ms. Cook mentioned, the, the life skills, um, the, the economics and personal finance class, like including the resume writing and life skills, I think that is great. Will that be included in the online version? Because I know a lot of students take that particular class online. Right now, I believe it'll be in the classroom part. We have to look at ways to implement it. Okay. 
Okay. And um, was curious about the, the Go Virginia cyber internships. We had a student from one student from each of the three high schools. How, how were those students chosen? They had to have experience in, in a classroom, um, either at the local school or at New Horizons, in a computer or in a cybersecurity program. And then so we looked at that and um, offered it to several students, and there were one from each high school that were interested. Um, a lot of them had trouble doing it after school because they were involved in sports and figuring out the schedule. So, but we did end up with the three from the three high schools. And so did we purposely aim to have one from the three, or that just happened? That just that happened that great. way. It was great, yes. That was great. And then um, was curious, too, about the, the um, job shadowing and the internships. How is the division reaching out to various businesses in the community to, to seek those Opportunities. I I um, right now, I am reaching out to some of the um, employers that were at our college and career fair or manufacturing day. We already know they have an interest in what's happening with our students. Um, also, we've had some that have just randomly sent emails. We want to be involved, so contacting them. Um, once we determine how we're going to structure it and what the framework will be, then we will really have a concerted effort in um, engaging all the employers in the area. Awesome. And the summit, yes. And um, through the summit we had in healthcare, all, uh, all the employers that were there were very interested in job shadows, clinical experiences, internships. And um, we will be, the next industry we will be tackling is manufacturing, and then we'll go from there. So we'll, that will really bring in a lot of employers, I think, that'll be interested. And so if there are businesses in the community, business leaders who are watching right now tonight, and they would like to have our students shadow in their place of business, Absolutely. who should? Who should they reach out to? They uh, could reach out to Sherry or myself. Okay. Yes. Ms. Hummel? Um, related to that, are we doing any um, internships about teachers? That is one thing we talked about. When we did the <laughs> IT internship, and that was internal, we thought it would be great if we could roll that out and for to have teachers that have interns or our um, maintenance department that would have interns our nurses in the schools, right. because that would be a great way, especially for our students that do not have transportation, that would be a good way to get them an internship and get them involved. I, I do know from personal experience, my mother had me um, uh, in high school help out at the, in the health, the health room, the school nurse room, and I learned from that experience that I never, ever <laughs> wanted to be a nurse. So it's, right. it's often very, very good yes. to, to <laughs> offer up these internships. So those opportunities, because we've added to our CTE program of studies for next year, the Virginia Teachers for Tomorrow 1 and 2, so we'll be able to run some of those opportunities through those courses as well. But thank you. Dr. Beers? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, you know, one of, one of the ways of, of uh, recruiting um, kids into, uh, students into, into the teaching profession, um, there are a number of programs that connect community college with a four-year school. William & Mary has one. Um, and if a student, uh, and it's less expensive, if a student uh, goes to a community college, there are certain courses that will uh, transfer in that will um, help satisfy some of the teaching course requirements, that that's a really, um, uh, it's a useful avenue um, in um, uh, Thomas Nelson's nearby. Um, so I, that would be, you know, another thing. I know some of the other divisions, that's exactly, especially the rural ones, that's a main thing. One of the main things they're doing is they're going into their high schools and they're, and they're, uh, and they're bringing um, teachers, other, other people in the profession to talk to the kid, to talk to the student. I got to stop calling them kids. <laughs> talk, I can still have my own kids. They're forty, but I can still call them kids. Anyway, um, um, and they, they, um, uh, and they, and they're going like the one I know about. They go to Rappahannock Community College, two years, and then they transfer to another four-year school. Uh, one of the things that I think we are going to see, we're going to see more community colleges start to develop four-year programs that will lead to uh, uh, teaching credentials and and because uh, uh, there's a real need for that but th that uh, that's I think that's something to consider the other thing question I have I and I should know the answer but I, I, I don't I probably did I don't know now who is eligible to sign up for AP courses any student is eligible as any long as they student. meet the prerequisite of okay. the prior everybody course. out there in the audience yes. out, out there 
there's no there, 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 there's no restriction no. on who's taking AP courses or who, who's not. Anybody can sign up for AP course, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank and you, I, I would like to comment, oh, I'm sorry. So through Early College Program, we actually do work with Thomas Nelson to our Community College to do the two-by-two -two programs. So a lot of our early college students, um, when they're signing up for courses for their spring semester, are advised of those two-by-two -two connections so that they can get their coursework at Thomas Nelson and then go to uh, university. And the other thing, I know that a lot of the colleges have, have, have uh, they've got a, they have agreements with the community college. Yes. William & Mary does. Yes. And, um, you don't have to be a straight A student, but you have to do well, um, and and that's basically the requirement. You you know, if you've been a good student, we will we will accept you because William and Mary made the decision uh, rather than grow the overall student body, is they would take more transfer students, and it's a perfect it's a perfect avenue for them. It really is. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Okay, moving on to um, board, matter, board matters and requests. Um, comments, starting with Ms. Young. Yes, uh, first of all, I'll, um, I um, just want to mention I did attend CTE. I apologize, I left my notes in the car, but uh, some, one of the things I definitely remember is that um, New Horizons has, had implemented, I believe, last year's signing day um, at um, at their school where students who had completed courses would be interviewed and hired by local employee employers and they have a signing day which is pretty I think pretty fantastic where students can come and actually sign on the dotted line they do walk out of school with a job which I think is amazing uh, was mentioned by from Sherry about uh, Na the NASA hunch I think that two of the students from uh, Warhill uh, completed the critical design component and now have been invited to the national competition in Dallas um, and that is solving a problem for the current uh, International Space Station of to what to do with all those tools that could be floating around that could be rather painful if they're floating so uh, I think that's pretty amazing that these two students actually stuck with that and developed that and they're now being invited to that competition um, I did want to mention that um, the Musical season is here. Um, I, I missed the one the other night at Berkeley, but uh, Greece is this week at Lafayette. Uh, we had one of our uh, um, speakers that came and talked about Greece at Lafayette. It's the 21st through the 23rd. There are a couple of matinees. If you look online, um, you can find them. Uh, but there is an evening performance on all three evenings, the 21st, the 22nd, 23rd. Uh, Jamestown is uh, is uh, performing Newsies April 11th through the 13th, and Mama Mia is going to be performed at Warhill uh, May 2nd through the 4th. Thank you. Uh, a quick congratulations to our teachers of the year that we honored tonight. Um, I saved my SEAC report till after they got to go home because I know our teachers are very hardworking and they didn't want to have to sit through my reports. <laughs> But now I will give that report to you because I attended the most recent SEAC meeting on March 14th and it was a jam-packed meeting. We had a lot to discuss um, and at this meeting we heard from teachers and administrators from Laurel Lane and Matthew Whaley. Both schools receive grants to assist in creating more inclusive classrooms and school environments. And some of the materials that they purchased were tables, items for common corners, flexible seating, and staff is also able to receive additional training, and Matthew Whaley staff even had a site visit to a state model for school inclusive practices in Virginia Beach, so that's very exciting. Um, and in regards to our own inclusion project, focus groups will be taking place with administrators, special education teachers, and general education teachers as well, and next month we should know how long it'll take to compile that data um, to bring back to the board. And also, the committee is currently looking at a way to educate others about individuals with disabilities by bringing awareness through avenues similar to Bullying Prevention Month, or Month of the Military Child, um, to ensure that more programming is available to our students. I'm related to this, so if any board members have any ideas, please feel free. Uh, just let me know or email me or call me. Um, and again, 
if anyone is interested in any local national news related to individuals with disabilities, as well as any training and advocacy opportunities, again, check out the SEAC Facebook page for the most recent information. And then I had a request, if it's okay with you. Could we invite our school counselors that are here to show us uh, what we have here? If they could come up. Yeah. yeah. Couldn't get the bubbles to work. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I'm very thankful because I sat on this. Um, so I'm very glad for the invitation. Um, we just want to thank you so much for supporting the request for five additional school counselors in the budget. And please know that we will continue to advocate at other levels for reducing school counselor to student ratios in support of school safety. We really just want to urge that this priority remain even as adjustments have to be considered. Did you know that in 2016, Colorado's Department of Education saw a return on investment of $319 million, or about $20 saved for every $1 invested in school counselors. Research reflects that school counselors have an integral role in closing achievement gaps, particularly for underserved and at-risk populations. And in short, we exist to promote the safety and success of all students. In your gifts, we included a little um, symbol of all that we stand for. We work to promote mindsets and behaviors for student success, which is our trophy. <laughs> We collaborate and consult, sticky notes involved there. We aim to, um, we, we aim to work with a supportive and solution focused approach. So rather than um, dwelling on problems or the negative, we are seeking solutions and we're training up students who think the same way with the growth mindset. Um, we also track the data and follow it to create programs that ad address the needs at each individual school. And then we collect data as we go so that we can show that we're making a difference using evidence-based lessons, programs, um, as well as groups, individual counseling. We're all about individual student planning. You've got your notepads, pencils. Um, we also are training crisis intervention. Even at the elementary level, we are doing risk assessments, um, self-harm assessments, threat assessments. At all levels, we want to support our students and be immediate in preserving the safety um, and getting those students wraparound services so that we can keep our schools safe and our families safe. So you have a box of Band-Aids. And last but not least, we also want to have a safe place for students to navigate stress. Um, we know that that's just increasing. I've seen a lot of talk, even just on my own social media, about how the stress levels these days in this generation are much different than they were when we were in school. And we, we really just want to teach students how to navigate those, those emotions and thought processes to become more successful. Um, as well as healthy. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This thing would have just messed me up all night. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Cook. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so it, uh, as Mrs. Young mentioned, it is uh, spring musical season, and I did have um, the opportunity to go to Berkeley Middle School and see Legally Blonde, and it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. And it was, it was it just the amount of work that goes into producing those events and the number of students involved. It's really quite incredible. And I'm uh, very proud to be part of this community that allows that to happen because it's, it's not easy. Um, I also wanted to report that I toured uh, Laurel Lane Elementary School with um, Supervisor McGlennon and Council Member Maslin. And just wanted to thank. Uh, Ms. Swan for, and her staff for taking the time to, to, to give us a tour of that wonderful place. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about the joint meeting and just thank both the James City County Board of Supervisors and Williamsburg City Council for their support, their ongoing support, 
and recognizing that our needs are real as they are weighed against their fiscal constraints. And I, I, um, I, I appreciate their acknowledging, um, as many of you, of you have said, uh, our, our benchmarking and uh, our justification of, of the, our request. Um, I, and I think that um, Dr. McGlennon's uh, remarks regarding the state um, were uh, dead on, and I, I look forward to perhaps one day uh, being able to advocate together to speak with one voice as a community, perhaps even larger than this community, to the state to, to really advocate for the state to change change its ways and, and start a funding, funding us appropriately because what they're doing now is just simply not enough. And um, I also really appreciate their taking the time to have two meetings, which is new. Uh, one meeting focused on the CIP and one um, had a little bit of the CIP, but mostly focused on our operating budget. And so uh, it, I think it demonstrates that, that our that our community values education. So I think that's great. And uh, and I appreciate the counselors mentioning uh, ongoing advocacy. I think both for the operating budget and for teacher raises and for more counselors, that advocacy is going to be critical. So uh, I do look forward to working with you to that end. And then also we mustn't forget the CIP, uh, even though they, they, they indicated that, um, that you know, that their hope is to fully fund our, our request in five years. I think we need to continue to, to justify that and advocate for it because there are many competing interests that are, equal, that are also important in our community. So anyway, I look forward to advocating together. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Dr. Beers? Yeah, first of all, I want to thank um, all the school counselors. Um, um, I have, uh, I, 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 as I mentioned before, spent a considerable amount of time down at James River um, um, looking at and finding out about the uh, very comprehensive counseling program that they have down there. And I know that's, that is just an example of the other ones that, I, that are, are going on at the other schools as well. Um, we do live in a stressful time and anything our counselors can do to uh, help either reduce or help students manage that um, is, is very important. Um, I also want to congratulate our teachers of the year and also the others in those schools who helped them as well. That would be the other teachers, all the support staff, and especially those principals that we saw tonight um, as well. Um, as I, uh, and, and I very much look forward to the theater productions of our three high schools. I, 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 uh, um, that's always a... Uh, a special time of the year, and I, I encourage the uh, uh, public to go to our website and find out when those are going to be shown and, um, and uh, support those as well. Um, tomorrow, the superintendent and I will be down in Norfolk at WHRO. Uh, she will be there for the superintendent's meeting, and uh, I will be there for the Hampton Roads Educational Television Association Educational Advisory Committee. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, 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 I can't do it. Um, uh, and the reason I mention that is tomorrow, Sean Avery, who's the president and CEO of the Hampton Roads Workforce Council, is going to be there and he's going to talk about the Hampton Roads talent assignment strategy. So I know we'll be taking copious notes and uh, be sharing that uh, with you uh, when we come back. And I've probably forgotten something else, but I've spoken too much already, so. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Mr. Kelly? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, would, I would have to say that I hope uh, next year that uh, Mr. Baker does a good job in losing that retirement letter from Mrs. Hundley. Um, yes. I'm not sure that personnel agenda is going to get the majority that's going to need to pass, so we might want to just kind of think about how that works. Um, you know, we talked a lot about tonight about teachers and, and um, having minority teachers and you know, this, this country really has a teaching crisis, um, not just of, of teachers of color and minorities, but of all teachers. Uh, as a country, we are just simply not valuing our teachers. As has been stated before, you know, the state gave us $33 million 10 years ago, and it gives us $35 million last year. Um, but we have a 1,000 more students than we had when they gave us $33 million. So you, you look at the value that the state government is putting on education, and you have to start to question where that is. In addition, in that time, 
we have increased our teacher's workload. We have we've removed assistance. We've increased our class sizes. We've required additional professional tr professional development. Um, we require them to fill out additional paperwork on the students and, and uh, um, on their jobs. We give them, uh, I don't want to say paltry salaries, but we give them paltry salaries. Um, so why would a high school kid want to consider being a teacher? I mean, and we really have to, have to, have to evaluate that as a society. Um, and the problem doesn't solve quickly because, you know, you know if, if we, if we do the right things in the next year, it takes, it takes a middle school kid to go through high school, go through college, and come out as, on the other end as in the profession. So it's not a problem that's going to be solved quickly. Um, many school systems in this commonwealth and, other, and across the country have a problem filling their teacher positions and filling their roles. That is only going to increase. We haven't had that problem necessarily here in WJCC, but it has been close. Um, we have 1,100 teachers-ish. Tim, you can help me with my, with my math there. We hired, about, last year I think we hired 120, 130. Only 20 had no teaching experience. So we, have, we get a lot of teachers from other school systems. They come here because they, because they want to raise their kids. They come here for our benefits probably. They come here for, for some, of, some of our salaries. But, but they come here to live in Williamsburg, Jane City County because of, because of what it is. So I have to echo what Ms. Humley said about you know, if, you're, if you have somebody out there who's a, who's a, who's a teacher and, and is interested in a job, call Mr. Baker, a, teach, a minority teacher, call Mr. Baker. Um, you know, Tim does a great job going out, and his staff do a great job going out to those historically black colleges and, draw, and trying to uh, recruit those, recruit teachers. But there's frankly, it's a numbers game. There's just, there's a, there is a real crisis in the number of teachers that are coming out of, coming out of the colleges these days and a crisis in the, in the number of teachers that, uh, for, particularly in minorities, that are just not filling the roles of the teachers leaving the profession. So we really have to kind of, as a, as a society, really um, put, put some thought into what we're, what we're really valuing. So, and I'd, I'd like to add my uh, congratulations to the teachers of the year tonight, and, um, and and it has been noted that there were no males in that in that crew, but let's also not remember that last year our teacher from this district was a was a male teacher. So, um, yeah, it was, numbers weren't with us this year, but well, they had. So. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, Ms. Hummel. Um, thank you. I uh, would like to thank the WJCC Foundation for yet another uh, a, a assignment of $34,575 in awards. And on Tuesday, March 26th, is going to be the uh, actual award. Um, yes. I, my, 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 yes, it's going to be the bus ride where we go around to all the schools and surprise the teachers and the staff members who are getting these awards. It's a really fun event. So uh, anyone, uh, I'm sure you can contact WJCC's central office and they can, if, you're, if you want to be a part of it, um, it'll be at Lafayette High School starting out, I think, at 8.30 in the morning. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out so everyone's aware of that. Uh, it is... 34,000 that our funding partners do not have to give us. <laughs> so our community has given us 34,000. So it's just, it, it's just amazing uh, that we've got so many, I guess, generous people that want to see our teachers uh, be able to do the innovative things that, that are kind of on their wish lists. So I wanted to plug that. I also want to say that I read the WJCC annual report and I was looking at it and I thought, this is just so different from last year. I really, really like it. I had no idea it was Link 5, but I, what I really liked about it were all the personalized photos and the quotes and the layout. And so anyway, I, I think that's that was... Our students in Link 5 at Lafayette did a great job. Speaking of Lafayette, it is the 12th anniversary of the first Greece in a while. Um, so 
We've got students coming back to Lafayette High School that were 12 years ago in that production, which was Suzanne McCory's first production um, as a high school uh, teacher or high school drama teacher. So anyway, we want to throw that out. Also wanted uh, to remind our viewing public that scholarships are out there for our high school graduating seniors and a lot of the deadlines are the end of this month so there's free money that different organizations want to give away so it's probably not the students that are listening to this at this point of night but maybe perhaps there might I don't know some parents so if you are a parent of a graduating uh, student look uh, or or really encourage your uh, student to to fill out these scholarships. It's not that hard and uh, it might be worth their while. And then finally, thank you, uh, Ms. Hunley, for coming and speaking to all of us. And I think, and just as a follow up to what uh, everyone was saying about the teacher situation, word of mouth might be our secret um, weapon of getting more minority teachers here. As a board member, I can assure you that Mr. Baker is doing everything in his power to try to hire minority teachers, but we have a supply problem. And I don't know whether it's our small location, our expensive, it's expensive to live here, uh, we're not a big city. <laughs> there, there are some issues, but it's a beautiful, wonderful community with great students and so it could be just a word of mouth to everyone if you know someone who it has a teacher license and would like to is a minority and would like to work in williamsburg james cdc jcc see mr baker like everyone is telling everyone that concludes my comments and i have just a few comments as well um, wanted to thank all of our public speakers who came tonight we had eight public speakers and so um, that's a lot based on the last the last several meetings and so I hope that that many folks and many more will continue to stay engaged in the budget process and so to Ms. Cook's point I think it's important for the listening public to understand that there is the operating budget that needs that folks need to be engaged in that um, the city and the county working through that as well as the CIP so Parents and families have come and spoken to us about let's the, the gym at Warhill, and so the CIP is going to speak to those those infrastructure building kinds of things, and so both both of those need to be um, advocated for and supported, and so I encourage the public to continue to do that over the next few weeks. Um, like my board colleagues, definitely need to recognize and say congratulations to our teachers of the year. Um, I do think the joint meeting went well, and one of the things that I'm pleased with in our community is that we do have a partnership with the city and the county, and they are our funding partners. And so the fact that we can come together and talk honestly about our needs um, is something that I very much appreciate. Um, with regard to the middle school plays and the high school plays, one of the things that I think is particularly cool this year, and it, maybe it has always happened, is that some of the high school students um, came to um, the Berkeley play, and so there's the support um, among the students, as well as faculty, and so the middle school faculty are supported by the high school faculty with regard to their productions, and I, I do, I've always thought Berkeley, all of our productions are phenomenal, but Berkeley does really put on a top-notch um, production. But I really did like seeing the high school students there to support uh, their middle school students. Um, so with that, I'll move on to um, meeting schedule. Um, so the Student Advisory Committee is meeting on March 27th um, at 3.30 in the Media Center at Warhill. Um, the NSBA annual convention, I'm looking forward to that, um, is next week, March 30th through April 1st um, in, in Philadelphia. Many of us, most, most all of us will be going to that along with uh, the superintendent. The School Liaison Committee is meeting April 10th at 8.15 in room 300 at the Annex. Uh, the 21st Century Career Ready Advisory Committee is meeting on April 10th at 3.30 in room 108 in Central Office. The Special Education Advisory Committee is meeting on April 11th um, at the James County Rec Center at 6.30 p.m. And the Policy Committee is meeting on April 17th at 8 o'clock in the morning in room 309. Madam Chair? Yes, Can tonight. I just make a correction for the Student Advisory Committee? Yes. It's, it's from 3 o'clock to 4.15 okay. on the 27th. Duly noted. Sirza, if you could update that for us. 
Um, and then upcoming meetings, we have our closed session on April 9th, 6 p.m. in the Annex, room 309, work session following that at 6.30 in room 300, and closed session on April 23rd um, here in Stryker, room 123, followed by a regular, regular meeting at 6.30. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>